Is this too much of a five o'clock shadow? Has this gotten to a six o'clock shadow? I'm not sure. It doesn't make me look too much like a mountain man, right? Maybe, maybe like a mountain hipster. So when January rolled around, I realized that there was like this list of games that were released last year that I had readily available, but I hadn't really gotten a chance to play. So now I've gotten a chance to play all those games that were on my bucket list from last year. And so I think that I'm ready to do every game I played from 2019 ranked from best to worst. And of course, that's a completely arbitrary thing I know based on my personal experiences and what I personally enjoyed or appreciated. And it was kind of hard for me to put this list together because a lot of this could have gone other ways. I moved some things around on this list several times, trying to be both fair and also objective because some games that people liked, I just didn't enjoy. I just frankly didn't enjoy. So trying to be, you know, fair to games that did stuff that was interesting or innovative uh, and for what they attempted, but also being realistic to whether I thought they were good or not. And I'm pretty sure that this is the order. Who knows? I, I don't know, man. <laughs> There's just a lot of games to get through. So let's jump right in. So my top pick is not going to surprise anybody. It's The Outer Worlds. I've already talked about it, so no real surprises here. Just in general, yeah, Obsidian really came into its own with this title, creating a rich narrative, a beautiful landscape, really engaging gameplay, great character development, wonderful NPCs, and a lot of real choices that are difficult to make, real dilemmas, not just plain evil and plain good, that make the whole experience and what happens to your character much richer, and the whole experience is just great overall. So yeah, it, it's, it's excellent. I love it. It's the kind of RPG that I think a lot of people who like that genre have been looking forward to for quite some time because it's been stagnant in recent years. So, I can't lie about this, I'm a huge Borderlands fan, so Borderlands 3 is next on this list, and it does a great job at everything that it puts forward. Yeah, it's more Borderlands, I get that. I know it doesn't revolutionize the genre, but you know what it does do? It takes everything that works from previous games and removes everything that doesn't. And then it adds in these wonderful new mechanics, uh, the idea of being able to switch gun modes and being able to finally vault on top of things. That's a revolution you never knew you needed. Sliding, there's a lot more style to it. So many more options for your characters in the, uh, the different skill trees that you can go down so your action skills can change depending on what you want to play as. They just did a great job with it overall. A lot of content, way more content than I thought was even going to be in it. And I got to give them credit for it. They made the most Borderlands game that you could ask for in the entire Borderlands series. So it, it's, it's addictive to the nth degree, and it's wonderful. I played it for way too long. So Bloodstained Ritual of the Night kind of came out of nowhere for me, and then I picked it up and I played it, and I wondered where this had been my whole life. It reinvigorated me in terms of how I felt about, like, Metroid and Castlevania titles, those, those old sort of 2D side-scrolling adventure games, and it completely blows that genre out of the water. It really proves that that is the kind of genre that really deserved a comeback in a big way, it wasn't a dead genre, it was just one that was asleep. And what they did with Miriam and this whole game is just so much fun. You're constantly getting new abilities uh, every, like, two minutes, three minutes, uh, crafting and uh, going to, into the, all the little nooks and crannies of this castle is uh, terrific. You want to explore every single inch of it, pretty much from the moment you start. At first, I thought A Plague Tale Innocence was the kind of game that only, you know, elite game critics liked, and that it wouldn't really be for me. But boy, I was wrong. It really is one of the best games of the year. It has this wonderful, dark fantasy setting, and dares to be a purely stealth action game. Like, literally, your main character dies if she gets hit once. So you really have to think about 
how you are playing and think strategically through this whole game. Yeah, the first half of it is basically an escort mission, but it is not cumbersome or laborious. And it keeps moving by at a really good pace and feels increasingly more desperate. They did a great job with this, and it also looks gorgeous. Lovers of Ether was a free-to-play game that was released on April Fool's Day by Dan Fornace and was based off the Rivals of Ether fighting game that he previously created and was completely, uh, well, a satire basically on uh, dating sims. And it was hilarious. And it was so entertaining the entire time I played it. And I go back and look at my playthrough of it and just laugh all over again because it is an absolute takedown of the genre. There is no other game from this past year that was as purely funny or well-written as this. And the fact that it was just 100% free it was just amazing. It doesn't get enough credit. You should go and play it right now. You're going to you're going to be incredibly impressed with how much fun it is. Try for the polar bear. Yeah, I dare you. I would actually argue that Devil May Cry 5 is the most accessible of all the DMC games, especially if you're not a huge fan of the series. It gives you some real interesting options by having a few different characters that you play that all play very differently. And yeah, it had its share of problems. I didn't want to change loadouts for Dante, and the game seemed to want me to without my permission. Don't do that to me, game. But it was a stylish experience throughout. That's always been a hallmark of the series, right? Style over substance. But they do it so well without the bosses feeling too laborious to get through. Like, they, it is still super fast. You start playing it and you just want to play more and more because, you know, it's just entertaining. You're not even that worried about what you're going to level up on your character or anything like that. You're just having a good time playing the game. Some of the controls might feel a little stilted. Some of the camera angles are a little weird. It's not perfect by any stretch of the imagination. But I mean, hey, you get to play Adam Driver, kind of. So there's that. You gotta love that. I wasn't always thrilled with the Metro series. I have played some of the previous installments, and I can tell you that they felt sort of like a corridor that you were running through most of the time. But they did something smart in Metro Exodus by actually opening it up to more open-world areas that allowed for exploration, and I think it really helped with these themes of survival and desperation, where you are going around different parts of the map just to scrounge some basic supplies. And yeah, it's not a huge feature-rich sort of environment. It's not like you're getting into big, heavy RPG elements. But they do at least attempt to try and take the user interface out of it and uh, make it more of an immersive experience. It goes away mostly when you hit any kind of button because there's context-sensitive stuff that comes up on screen. But at least they made the effort, and uh, I think it only improved it overall. After Party is the latest game from Night School Studios. They made Oxenfree previously, but this is a much more tongue-in-cheek, more sarcastic game than that one was. They have this style where they make the entire thing feel almost like a play where the camera is panned way out, uh, so the characters are almost characters on a stage, right? So the whole thing feels... Uh, very much like you are watching as the curtains are going between different acts. The overall effect is very interesting, although I have to say that I kind of wanted to be able to zoom in on my character so I could see what was going on. Even on a large television, sometimes it's very hard. But the whole idea of challenging the devil to a drinking contest so you can try and get out of hell... That's just great stuff right there. It's it's really a narrative game, but being able to add in dialogue options based on the drinks is pretty great. I mean, you get to talk like a pirate. Uh, it's not a terribly long game, but it is a very fun one. And uh, as far as narrative-based games go, it uh, has a little bit more depth and a little bit more option than you might be used to from a typical like walking simulator. Children of Morta might have some pixel graphics that might be hard for certain people, <clears throat> Alex, to get around, but what it does do 
with those graphics is quite impressive. It is actually quite beautiful in the style that they chose. But more importantly is how it implements the game mechanics, which makes the whole thing feel sort of like the randomized dungeon part of Diablo, where you are going through increasingly difficult dungeons as the Bergson family. And the really neat part about this is being able to take a look inside the Bergson's lives uh, between every attempt at a run, being able to see what the family is doing back at the homestead, and also trying out different members of the family that kind of take on classic archetypes like a fighter and a rogue and an archer. But also the idea that leveling them up and increasing their skills also gives passive bonuses to all the other members of the family, really encouraging you to try out every single one of them and really experience all of those in tandem. Like, if you're interested in the hack and slash genre, this is definitely going to scratch that itch and adds in a couple unique twists along the way. Slay the Spire is a roguelike, which should mean that I don't like it very much, but as a card game, it adds a level of strategy that I appreciated. Yeah, there are some things about it that I wasn't thrilled by. Like, for instance, I wanted to be able to keep the cards in my hand that I didn't use. I didn't really want the game to just discard everything I didn't use because it would have allowed for more strategy, figuring out what I might hold off on for defense cards because I don't need them right now, but instead the game just keeps discarding it left and right. Still, there's some great replayability by having a few different characters that have unique decks to go through. And it's a, it's a blast to try out and play through and see what kind of cards you can unlock. Yeah, it's a really interesting, innovative, very unique experience overall. Some people are probably going to be upset with me that Untitled Goose Game is so far down this list, but I'm sorry, folks. Uh, it's, it's a meme that is also a game. I can't... Look, it's true. It's true. But I didn't want the fact that so many people turned it into basically a meme to underlie the fact that the game is actually pretty enjoyable. Yeah, it's not particularly long for the couple hours that you end up playing it. Maybe maybe for four or so if you want to complete all the optional objectives. It is an enjoyable enough experience. It's also a very simple one with limited replay value, let's just be honest. But it looks really cool, and the music is really nice, and I did enjoy playing the game, so I give it credit for that, but I don't feel like it necessarily deserves the lofty heights that some that some people on the internet give it. I think that that's just a little bit of overkill, because the goose is a meme. Look, I mean, as far as games that involve angry waterfowl goes, it's up there. It's, it's definitely up there for this year. There was a goose in Plague Tale Innocence, though. So, not necessarily even at the top. Oh, no, not even at the top of that. The internet's going to kill me. And I can tell that people are also not going to be happy to know that Outer Wilds is next down on this list. Yeah, I understand. It's very innovative, and I did appreciate that it tried something new by being like a purely exploration-based game. Exploring this solar system and trying to uncover the mysteries, and then every like 23 minutes, the whole solar system resets and you go back to square one, just armed with the knowledge that you had uncovered during your last playthrough. And that's very interesting interesting, it's very innovative, it can also be incredibly boring, and it can be very confusing to figure out where you're supposed to go in this game, because most of the time I didn't know what my objective was, where I was supposed to go, what I was supposed to do, I didn't have a clear idea of anything I was supposed to accomplish or what my end game was ultimately going to be, and it's the reason why I eventually put it down. It doesn't change the fact that, yeah, it does look really great, and it has some interesting, innovative features, but not a great game do those things make. Vambrace, Cold Soul, sort of just came out of nowhere for me, and one day I found out that it existed, but I have to say that in terms of what it did, it was actually pretty impressive, and I really feel like it deserved more attention than it got. Uh, it's a roguelike, and yeah, you're going through kind of dungeon after dungeon after dungeon, uh, and uh, you're constantly losing stamina. You, you die if you have stamina, go to zero, or if you have your health, go to zero. 
Uh, but it's also not really a true roguelike because your main character will never die, just maybe her compatriots and you might lose the items that you had collected. But it doesn't change the fact that the graphic style is just so cool. It looks great. And uh, yeah, the battle system is sort of an old school turn-based uh, variety, but I didn't mind it. The only thing that really drags it down is I started to realize that it felt like on every run that I was doing, I seemed to be making less and less progress to the point where it felt very stagnant. And it's at that point that I was like, eh, I, I don't really see the point in playing anymore. But yeah, no, the graphics are great. Indivisible is an interesting cross between like a platformer and like a, an action RPG. And it kind of moves between those two genres in a really funky way between like your open world exploration and then your battle screens. Uh, the graphics on this are, again, amazing. I feel like I'm going to say that a lot. Like from a presentation standpoint, this was great. From a gameplay standpoint, not so much. But it really felt like if Don Bluth were around today, this is the kind of graphic style he would go for. And it looks amazing. It is a pretty, pretty game to look at. And I like the idea that your lead character, she like absorbs people into her head and then they come out when it is necessary. That was neat. And the voice cast was really impressive. I didn't know Matt Mercer did a voice in this thing. I never knew that that was the case. But hey, he gets to be like a bird. That's neat. The big problem that weighs this down is one, Oh, wow, they have way too many characters that you encounter. Like, every half hour, there's another NPC that joins your party. But then also, the big problem with Indivisible is that, you know how I said that it feels like there's a couple disparate, you know, genres in here? They don't really mesh well together. Individually, they work okay. But as a, you know, a whole... They don't really transition all that well between one and the other, and there's a little bit of cognitive dissonance there that keeps it from being truly great, and, uh, you know, the platforming is a little rough, honestly. Rage 2 uh, at least attempted to be different than the original Rage. Unfortunately, it had the problem of being very similar to the game that is right after it on this list. These two were my most forgettable games of the year, which is why they're kind of positioned somewhere in the lower middle of this video. Um, but uh, the truth of the matter is I give a little bit of a, an edge to Rage 2 just because, yeah, it did attempt something different. Uh, Far Cry New Dawn, however, uh, yeah, it's just Far Cry 5. The, literally, the map is the same. The only thing is, is that they changed the models for the different animals, and the storyline is different. But yeah, the, the landscape, the world that they created is basically the same. Uh, you know, uh, they, they had some neat stuff in it, but it's nothing to write home about. Uh, yeah, they, they are still pretty forgettable, and I don't necessarily remember what happened in what one. They were fun to play while I was playing them. Don't get me wrong. They were fun to play while I was playing them. But after I was done playing with them, I had little to no interest of ever playing them again. Kingdom Hearts is the kind of series that has this wonderfully endearing quality of having these lively, colorful Disney worlds represented inside of it, and then ultimately gets dragged down by Square Enix creating the most incomprehensible storyline imaginable. And unfortunately, Kingdom Hearts 3 is no different, and in some ways is the culmination of the most convoluted story I have ever seen. And it gets to the point where I no longer know who are the good guys, who are the bad guys, who are we fighting, do we like these people, what are all of their names, how many versions of one person are there, are they all bad, are they all good, I was so confused. That's unfortunate, because the worlds themselves are pretty lively and fun, but it really does feel like all of those Disney worlds and stories are ancillary to them trying to squeeze this absolutely convoluted anime storyline into it. You know, you're just going through all of those worlds to say that the characters are there, and it really has so little to do with them. And oh my god, why do Donald and Goofy have to be so annoying? Why? Why? 
I, I, you know what? Donald should be, there should be untitled Donald game, and that would make perfect sense. There should be a mod so you can play Donald in Untitled Goose game, because it works perfectly well. He was so much more annoying than that damn goose. So the next game down on my list is Wolfenstein Youngblood, and look, a lot of the criticisms that were made about this game that earned it a place on many worst of lists are not uncalled for. I mean, yeah, the main characters can be kind of annoying, and yeah, the enemies are basically damaged sponges, which I didn't like, and yeah, there's a lot of repetitive qualities, and the writing isn't as good, and yeah, there's a lot of problems, okay? I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna fault people for saying that there were a lot of problems. There are. Uh, but, you know, you do still get to play B.J. Blazkowicz's daughters in cyber armor using a laser gun on Nazis in, uh, you know, New Paris. So, there's some stuff that still works. <laughs> the fact that my AI companion is more of a hindrance than a help is still actually pretty annoying. But, I mean, it, hey, it still had some stuff going for it. Enough for me to finish it. There's that. The ending's kind of meh, but, you know. It's not a great game, but I had some fun with it. Sorry. You know, recently The Division 2 went on sale for three whole dollars, and I had played it a little bit before. Actually played it for quite a bit. And I thought, well, you know, it wasn't a great experience for me, but for three bucks, why not? They're going to add some new content into it later. Uh, I fell asleep twice, and that kind of explains everything you need to know about The Division 2. It is kind of boring and repetitive. And the things that work about it, like being able to have a drone and a turret, it, you know, they work, and they work pretty well, but it doesn't stop the fact that there's just so much tedious stuff to do. There's all of these quests that you do at different uh, bases of operation, but you have to go specifically to those bases, even though they tell you over here that your quest is complete. You have to then go to another place and find the right person to turn it in. It, they make it kind of the least user-friendly interface possible. And ultimately, this is the epitome of the Ubisoft problem, is this idea of doing the same five activities over and over and over again ad nauseum, but they feel more and more samey in this game than they usually do in most of their other series. And it's not that the game is necessarily bad, at least it's playable. I couldn't say the same about the original Division. It functions... It's damn near functional, <laughs> but I didn't find it enjoyable. Outward is an interesting concept, and I think that that's the best thing I can say about it. You know, the idea that your titular hero in the game just needs money, so they do not get evicted from their home, and that's why they go out adventuring, is a really neat idea. And that this is a fantasy world... Uh, is also, you know, even more endearing, you know. But ultimately, the fact that the user interface and the overall quality of life that the players are going to go through to try and make this game enjoyable and not utterly boring really sinks it. Like, the idea that we don't have fast travel points, or that I can't see myself on the map, so I don't really even know where I am, it ultimately just makes the game not enjoyable. And that's unfortunate because the concept was really great, but the actual gameplay and what you do is not. Minute is a very small game from Devolver Digital that takes a similar idea to Outer Wilds, where you have a loop, but instead of like a 23-minute loop, you have a one-minute loop. And that could be very interesting, but it also makes the whole thing feel very kind of short and simple and kind of frenetic. It's a neat idea. Again, this list is full of really neat ideas that didn't necessarily go anywhere. Minute's kind of one of them. And I would talk about it more, but I think that my next loop is coming up right about now. And this is the point where we talk about Anthem. Yeah, Anthem was bad. Anthem was, was not good. Yeah, it looks pretty. Don't get me wrong. The graphics look great. And it is. And this is the best defense I can give for Anthem. Downright serviceable. Serviceable, I say. 
But the fact is that there are such lofty goals that we put to BioWare because we know that BioWare is capable of doing great work. And this ain't it. It is kind of a boring, tedious experience overall. Yeah, I did like flying around in my Iron Man suit for the time that I'm allowed to fly. <laughs> but the truth of the matter is, is that it felt so generic and tedious and pointless by comparison to what you expect a Bioware RPG to be. This really did feel like a game they did not want to make, but were kind of coaxed into making because why have them work on like a Star Wars game? It's not like EA has the Star Wars license. Oh wait, they do. I mean, I, I did have moments of enjoyment with this game, but it's hard for me to give it any real marks considering I've watched this once great studio fall utterly from grace. It's just so disheartening to see. But wait, there are levels below this. Oh yeah, we still have a ways to go. Crackdown 3 is basically just Crackdown. Terry Crews can't save this game from feeling like a 10-year-old game that just got released. Most of the things that they promised for this game, like for instance being able to have fully destructible environments, yeah that ain't in there. It, it's, just, it's just not. All of the mission structures and everything that you're doing in the game, it feels exactly the same as the original title. And it has not aged well. <laughs> Sorry. It really hasn't. This game actually got me to a point where I no longer want to collect orbs. Yeah, Crackdown, you ruined collecting orbs for me. It's just, it, it, I no longer enjoy the experience. Thanks, Crackdown 3. <laughs> Assassin's Creed 3 Remastered, I didn't really know if I wanted to put it on this list at all because it is just a remaster of a game that came out previously, but it is kind of its own unique title. And the reason why it's so far down this list is, one, it wasn't really my favorite AC game to begin with, but also the remaster did very little to endear it to me anymore. I mean, yeah, it looks better, granted, and yeah, it does play a little bit better, but somehow they made the American Revolution feel kind of boring and lame, and I don't know how they did that, but they managed it in this game. And then they committed a sin that I really will not forgive them for. You see, in AC3 Remastered, there is also, hidden in the back here, uh, Assassin's Creed Liberation. And it doesn't really get billing at all in the title, and it's kind of tucked away in there as an afterthought. And frankly, I think Liberation was the better game, with a more interesting protagonist. I'm sorry, Connor is like a wet blanket compared to Aveline and I much rather would play as her. And I feel like it deserved a lot better billing on this title. Um, yeah, it should actually get points for having liberation in it, but it doesn't because they just neglected the poor thing that was like a really great game and really should have been expanded upon. That's the game that they should have spent more time on, and they didn't. So it's, it's going near the bottom, sorry. Okay, some people are really going to hate that I put it this far down the list. <laughs> but Remnant from the Ashes is on here right near the bottom. Not the very bottom, we're getting there. But Remnant from the Ashes for me was everything I didn't like about Dark Souls with nothing of the redeeming qualities. Oh, but it's Dark Souls with guns, Nathan. Yeah, guns that suck. Guns that take forever to reload that have, like, three shots. What? And considering the focus on melee combat for most of the enemies you come across, I'd rather have had my sword and shield at this point. You know how in Dark Souls people really like the idea that there were multiple paths you could take to different objectives? You didn't have to go in one linear line? Well, Remnant fixed that by having basically one tunnel system that you can access in two different places, and they lead to the same damn boss battle. And I gotta tell you, if you can get through that very first boss battle and not hate yourself or this game, more power to you. I just lost it. It feels cheap and tedious and pointless and completely unrefined. You should have just played Dark Souls, folks. 
Remnant is it adds nothing to the conversation. It adds nothing to the dialogue and is one of the worst versions of a Souls-like game I have ever played. And it's ironic because I played Darksiders 3, which is also from Gunfire Games, and they took similar elements from Dark Souls. And I like that maybe because it had some DMC added in there with all of like the, 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 the kicks and the whips and everything. I don't know. But the point is, is that Remnant just feels clunky and I did not like it, and in, it, it's the worst version of a Souls game I could imagine. I hope. <laughs> and now we reach the bottom of the list to a game I don't know how many people played. I don't really know, but uh, it's Void Bastards. If you've never heard of Void Bastards, that's probably for the best. Uh, at first, you think that there's going to be something great to this game, right? Because it has like a, a cell shaded comic book style. You know, even the cutscenes are done like in panels. And the idea seems like it might be interesting, you know, like a strategic shooter is what it's called. Strategic shooter, where you play a series of criminals that are being tasked to go onto these derelict ships and collect a bunch of resources. The problem is, is that the tactical shooter part doesn't, what's the word, work. Most of the time you realize that the easiest thing for you to do would be to just shoot enemies as they arrive, but then the game says, no, 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 you can't just go and do that because we have to show you how to use like these landmines and stuff and set up traps, which never ends up working right and just ends up being a tedious experience where you're trying to set up these traps that you know ultimately are going to pretty much fail while enemies are coming around corners that you never expected them to and just show up out of nowhere. But then it commits a cardinal sin of game design in making the whole thing feel confusing. Because you'll go onto a derelict ship and it will say, hey, there's no enemies on here, just portals. Now, you kind of think like, well, maybe some stuff comes through those portals or whatever, but no enemies, so maybe this would be good for me because I don't want to get into a battle. And then all of a sudden, Enemies come through the portals. Well, they never explain that. So there are enemies there, and they're just giving you a lot of very confusing information to strategize, which, if it's a strategic shooter, you would hope they would give you pretty clear details on what those rules are. But they don't. All the while, you have, like, an oxygen meter that's counting down, uh, because, of course, there's an oxygen meter. There is one in every space game for some unknown reason, just to give you another thing to look at. Well, I didn't like it. It's kind of like a roguelike, but I've had good and bad experiences with that genre, and this is not a good one. No, I would say avoid at all possible costs. Um, yeah. And so those are all the games from 2019 that I played. From uh, the very good to the very bad. So what do you think? Are there games from 2019 that I had not played that I probably should take a look at? Uh, either because you think that they were really great or you want to see me suffer. I don't know. If you do have uh, some suggestions for games like that, uh, feel free to leave them in the comments down below uh, because I will look at them. And hey, feel free to tell me what your favorite and least favorite games were from this last year. Uh, because, you know, yeah, it might be March, but the thing about it is, is that we can still kind of look a little bit retroactively. And now that the new year is kind of in full swing, I think we can get a little bit better clarity on it. So, uh, yeah, let me know uh, what you think. And uh, feel free to tell me that I'm completely wrong. I'm sure that there are some placements of those rankings that people are going to have an issue with. Uh, if anyone actually watches this video, I don't know. <laughs> Thank you for watching, and join me on the next episode where we talk about all the games I played from 1919. I'm telling you right now, Hoop and Stick is a strong competitor for Game of the Year. You'll have to watch to find out. And, uh, oh, uh oh. Amicia has fallen through the walls of the castle. That's just poor construction right there. Come on, Nero, make the jump. You know, with how acrobatic you are, like maybe a little forward momentum would help out. That'd be great, not straight up. Okay, I just need to go fill my watering can, like so. 
And... I have no idea if that actually worked. Go towards the pretty red... Uh-oh. Oh no! A giant anglerfish ate me, I guess. <laughs> and so we have arrived at Joseph Seed's hidden camp. Terrific. Let's just go on. Uh... Alright. You come... Gina? Gina? Gina, that's not how you get out of a boat. Hey, Jess. Jess, could you come help me with this? I, I can't, I can't activate this myself. I'm gonna put my hand on this poster. And then if you could, um... Jess? Jess, come on! AIs, man. Next on National Treasure, I'm gonna steal the Declaration of Independence. Right, Nick Cage in Division Two. To <laughs> Hold X and okay, let's try that again. Hold X. Nothing. This should be working, like this entire game. It should be working, but it's not. This is a perfect visual representation of Anthem. <laughs> it just should work, but it doesn't. Oh, that is real unfortunate. And oh no. He succumbs to his greatest enemy. No, not explosions or soldiers with guns, but the trees. It was always my intent to try and make Glenn from The Walking Dead, and I really don't think I succeeded in any way, shape, or form. Oh, that's not bad. That's not bad. I like the beard, though. Screw it, I'm going with the beard. Okay, see, I like this. This is a uh, Mutant Year Zero Road to Eden. It's it's sort of like XCOM. This is this is good. This could be up near the. Oh, it was actually released in December 2018. So, never mind. <laughs>